Hello, my name is Scott Ellsworth. I welcome you to this introduction of Liberty Workforce. Liberty Workforce is a new form of business. It liberates the workers and engages their passion in achieving success for the business while preserving the property rights of the owners. It puts both the owners and the workers on the same team. They share together the governing, the work, the risk, and the reward of enterprise. It will yield higher performance, greater happiness, and less suffering. I believe it will be the Wright Brothers airplane of the business world. To my knowledge, it is the first business model to achieve viable worker-owner shared governance while maintaining access to conventional sources of capital. It does this without government intervention, any changes in laws, or union involvement. Many people added their energy and expertise to the concepts of the Wright Brothers to create the airplanes we enjoy today. Likewise, I hope you will add your knowledge, experience, and creative insight to Liberty Workforce and revolutionize the business world like powered flight transformed the transportation world. Understanding Liberty Workforce will be easier if you think of business as a form of government. Webster defines government as the exercise of authority over an organization, institution, state, district, and so forth, as direction, control, rule, and management. Business and political government share many common functions. For example, both decide what their members can and cannot do, the legislative function. Both punish members who deviate from accepted norms, the judicial function. Both take action to achieve desired goals, the executive function. I propose that many of the same struggles mankind has experienced with their political governments down through history can be found today in the business world. Furthermore, the innovations resulting from these political struggles can be applied to business with similar success. The Declaration of Independence explains clearly my sentiments about the prevalent form of business today. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, Business entities are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. A business governs owners and workers. Thus, its just power to govern derives from the consent of both the workers and owners, not from the property rights of the owners alone. That whenever any form of business becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new business form, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. I believe our present form of business is too often destructive of the rights of workers. There might be even owners who feel that present forms do not serve them well either. The purpose of Liberty Workforce is to institute a new business form that will achieve and secure the inalienable rights of both workers and owners. The Declaration then goes on to list the Founders' grievances with the British government. Likewise, I will now present examples of aggravations workers and owners face under the current form of business. Liberty Workforce can overcome every one of these concerns. First, we consider some problems owners have that are fixed by Liberty Workforce. Owners carry alone the financial burdens the worry of making payroll and the stress of keeping up sales to avoid layoffs. Owners feel like some unsupervised employees just play. If you turn your back on them, they will goof off and not work. They wish all employees would think and act like owners. Firing and layoffs are the most dreaded tasks. They wish they never had to do it. Some employees are just getting by. They are not fully engaged in their work. Next, we look at workers' challenges that are fixed by Liberty Workforce. Some workers think that working longer and harder gets them nothing because their salary is fixed. It just makes the owner richer. Inmates are freer in prison than some employees are at work. Workers are told what to do, when to do, it, and how to do it. The difference is that workers usually get to go home at the end of the day. Improving things at work is not worth the effort. When they try, they either get the evil eye or have to fight mountains of red tape. It just isn't worth it. 
Impending layoffs wear them down, no matter how good they are or how hard they work. Low totem employees know they will get the axe if there are more layoffs. For some, their stress response to this results in lower productivity. Some bosses are jerks. They turn a dream job into a nightmare. Last, we look at a problem that advocates of economic democracy and worker empowerment have, which is solved by Liberty Workforce. These advocates think that the spread of worker self-management in America depends on expanding worker ownership. But workers have so little capital. Consequently, worker participation in business governance will always be limited. As I describe Liberty Workforce, you will see how each of these challenges of owners, workers, and advocates are overcome. Once they declared themselves free of Britain, the founders replaced the British government with the Articles of Confederation. This was an improvement, but they felt they could do better. The result of their efforts was our present form of national government. The principles embodied in the U.S. Constitution are a key factor in the unparalleled liberty, power, and prosperity of the United States of America. I believe the incorporation of these principles into a form of business will yield the same transcending success for business as they did for our nation. This is one of the foundational concepts of Liberty Workforce. Not only will they resolve problems, the application of these principles will enhance existing and create new desirable outcomes. Business is almost guaranteed to have at least an average profit each year. Predictability inside the workplace, plus more freedom, plus responsibility, will yield greater worker growth. Sometimes the landscape of work resembles the chaos of life under competing warlords. No one wants to build in such an unpredictable environment. When peace and freedom are assured, the people will again start building for the future. It is likewise in business. Liberty workforce will result in greater personal growth in workers as they shoulder responsibilities in a free and predictable workplace. Competency in efficient democratic skills. The change will be so significant it is hard to imagine the effectual impact workers will have on their PTAs and HOAs and cities, state and federal governments as they apply the democratic skills they acquire for work. Not only will they know how to do it, they will demand that their elected leaders also become efficient. They will not tolerate gridlock in Congress. Rapidly adaptive and innovative large business. What small business is famous for, Liberty Workforce will bring to large business. Higher quality of life, such as expanded teleworking, on-site daycare, and so forth. As workers pay for everything and they have the power to decide, they will implement benefits they value. Business will be inherently responsive to the needs of local society. Workers share governance in the business. Their decisions will reflect their, their needs, and their needs will be representative of the needs of their neighbors. As I have worked to apply the founding principles of the United States to business, I am amazed at the new form of business that has emerged. It is simple and secure, yet it fixes all these problems and enables so much that is hard or not possible to do with present business forms. To introduce the Liberty Workforce model, this presentation will look at four of its elements. Legal structure, finances, governance, and involuntary worker separation. The place to start explaining Liberty Workforce is the legal structure. The innovations here are key to making worker-owner shared governance possible and viable. The legal structure of a Liberty Workforce business is bifurcated. It is comprised of two legal entities, the owner's legal entity and the worker's legal entity. The relationship between the two entities is defined by a lease agreement. The lease requires that both entities abide by their constitution. A single constitution governs both entities. The lease and the constitution can only be amended through agreement of both entities. The owner's legal entity is called ownerly for short. It could be in the form of a sole proprietor, a partnership, a corporation, a limited liability company, or almost any kind of legal entity. It is the legal entity of the business in its present form. It remains as it is. 
The owner owns the assets of the business, physical assets such as buildings and factories, intellectual property, which includes trade secrets, patents, copyrights, and so forth, capital in the form of cash, securities, and other liquid assets. The owner also incurs any liabilities such as bank loans. The owner has few, if any, employees. The worker's legal entity is called Workerly for short. It is a limited liability company that is manager-managed. All the workers, including management, are part of the Workerly. They are not employees. They are members, or in other words, owners, of the limited liability company that is the Workerly. Working as members rather than as employees allows the worker self-determination, free of government laws about employees. It also reduces the administrative costs of compliance to those laws. The workerly owns little or no assets. It leases those of the ownerly. Let's look at that lease. The ownerly leases its assets to the workerly. The workerly operates those assets, or in other words, conducts the business operations. Out of the revenue from these operations, the workerly makes a lease payment to the ownerly for the privilege of using the ownerly's assets. The ownerly provides working capital to the workerly and capital for business growth and renovations. Both the ownerly and the workerly bind themselves to uphold and enforce their business constitution. The ownerly workerly lease is intended and written to be enduring and indissolvable. There are no means to dissolve the lease. The lease explicitly states that it is perpetual. The division of property and power between the ownerly and the workerly is made in such a manner that neither entity can function as a business without the other. The ownerly has factories, but no managers or workers. It cannot afford to break with the workerly and obtain all new workers. Likewise, the workerly knows how to operate the factory, but it cannot afford to design new products and build another factory so that it can break with the ownerly. The lease is written so that neither party can make end runs around the other. For example, the ownerly cannot break the lease with the workerly by hiring workers directly as employees of the ownerly. The lease is designed to give the ownerly and the workerly no other recourse but to work out their differences and work together for the success of the business. The ownerly workerly bifurcated design of Liberty Workforce creates several essential advantages. It provides to the workers legal rights to share governance with the owners. The workers sharing in governance is an untenable condition when it depends on the whim of the owner. Through the lease, the workers sharing in the governance of the business becomes a property right they own. The workers will be able to use existing legal remedies to preserve this right. No new laws or other government participation is needed to establish a right for workers to share governance. It provides worker-managed businesses access to capital markets. The ownership of the business remains untouched by Liberty Workforce. The ownerly still has access to funding from sources such as venture capitalists, banks, and the stock market, just like any conventional business. With a guaranteed profit feature that I will discuss shortly, a Liberty Workforce business might likely be preferred by investors over conventional forms of business. This design enables workers to participate in the governance of their workplace without a significant financial investment on their part. It means that the growth of worker-managed businesses no longer depends on capital contributed by the workers. It enthrones the rule of law in the business. I will discuss the rule of law next but it is the bifurcated design with the lease that binds workers and owners to their laws and makes their laws legally enforceable in government courts. In essence, it makes the rule of law, law. The final legal element is the rule of law and the business constitution. This element is comprised of principles from the founding of the United States. In a business, there are some actions and behaviors that are required or encouraged. There are some that are prohibited or discouraged. The process of determining these actions and behaviors and enforcing them is called rule. Here are three types of rule. Rule by boss means that whatever the boss says goes. The rules can change when the boss's mood changes or when the boss has changed. There's no way of knowing for sure what the rule will be tomorrow. The boss enforces his rules. Rule by culture is at play in phrases like 
Well, this is the way we do things around here. It is not directly knowable. It is usually unwritten and is passed on informally and haphazardly through personal interaction. Social forces, such as peer pressure, enforce culture. Rule by law is what we are familiar with in our political governments. Four elements must be present to achieve rule by law. The laws must be set forth in writing and widely communicated among the owners and workers. Only consequences specified in the law are allowed. No other consequences may be imposed on a worker or an owner. Owners and workers freely choose to comply with the law. An impartial agent administers the law. Unless he is that agent, a worker cannot impose a consequence upon another worker. The advantages of rule by law are when expected behaviors are identified, communicated, and followed, higher organizational efficiency is achieved, and organizations experience reduced destructive internal conflict. The impartial third party feature of rule by law will also reduce the damage from conflict. Writing the rules and communicating them will yield a longer life for the ruling system. Rule by law contributes to increased worker initiative. This is the big ticket advantage. When expectations are the purview of management and the expectations shift in unpredictable ways, risk adverse workers may adopt an excessively conservative work style which diminishes valuable qualities such as innovation, productivity, and customer satisfaction. Conversely, when organizational consequences of behavior are based in law, workers are more likely to take the risks necessary to achieve growth, innovation, and excellence. A constitution is the structure and guardian of the rule of law. The U.S. Constitution is a good example of what issues should be addressed in a business constitution and provides ideas on how to address them. A business constitution does the following. Identifies the sovereign power, which is the workers and the owners. Establishes law as the vehicle of rule. Lays out the mechanics of the government. Enumerates and limits powers of the business government secures rights of the workers and the owners, and provides an amendment process. Next, I will cover some financial elements of Liberty Workforce. This will present the most compelling reasons why an owner should want a Liberty Workforce. These concepts require a deep commitment from the workers and an abiding belief in their abilities. These are the key financial concepts. As previously stated, the owners provide capital to the business as they do now through typical sources such as retained earnings, equity financing, and debt. The workers do not provide any capital or make any investment in the business. The workerly pays the deductible expenses of the business except for costs of capital such as interest. The ownerly pays all capital expenses and costs of capital. The amount of the lease payment is such that the owners will receive an average return on their assets. The average is the historical average of the owner's business. The return is based on earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. The EBITDA metric is used because it most closely reflects the value of the assets to the workerly. The amount of the assets in this calculation is the book value of the assets leased to the workerly. The workerly pays the lease before distributing compensation to the workers. Thus, unless there are unusual events like weather destroying assets or massive accounting write-downs or skyrocketing interest rates in a highly leveraged business, the owners in a Liberty Workforce business are guaranteed to have at least an average profit every year. With profit sharing discussed later, the profit could be even higher than average. This almost guaranteed profit is the main incentive to the owners to share governance with the workers. Not only will the owners benefit by the steady return, this guarantee will likely increase the worth of the business. Furthermore, the guarantee should make the business more attractive to lenders. To make this possible, all worker compensation is at risk. This means that there are no fixed salaries or wages. If there is not enough money left after paying expenses and the lease, then the workers only get a portion of their pay. This risk is the price of sharing the governance. However, on the upside, if there is more than enough money left, then Liberty Workforce guarantees the workers a share of this excess in addition to their salaries and wages. 
While bearing this risk is a mental shift for the worker in Liberty Workforce, it is not a real change in risk. The workers already bear this risk, but in a different fashion. In the typical business today, if there is not enough money to pay the workers, the owners lay off enough workers until there is enough to pay the remaining workers. The difference in Liberty Workforce is that this risk is made explicit and the workers are given greater power over that risk. Worker compensation at risk is another critical inducement to the owner to share governance. In a typical business, the desire of the worker for a larger paycheck is at odds with the owner's desire for a larger profit. Why would the owner want to share power with workers in this arrangement? It would likely result in smaller profits and higher wages. But in Liberty Workforce, the desires of the worker and the owner are aligned. Both larger paychecks and higher profits are directly linked to greater business success. It is much easier to persuade an owner to share governance with the workers when the workers want the same things the owners want. Worker compensation at risk is key to achieving shared worker-owner governance. To further understand these financial concepts, we will look at some examples of how the revenue of the workerly is distributed. The workerly retains no earnings, so all the workerly revenue is distributed out. This bar represents the annual revenue of a workerly. The business costs for which the workerly is responsible are calculated and paid. The remainder is carried forward to the next step. The lease payment is then calculated and paid. Again, the remainder is carried forward. At this point, I need to introduce two new terms, standard salary and standard payroll. A worker's standard salary is the amount of basic compensation a worker would receive if there is plenty of revenue left after costs and the lease have been paid. It is equivalent to what is just called a salary in the present form of business. Standard payroll is the sum of every worker's standard salary. In this example, there is enough revenue to make the standard payroll. The remainder is for profit sharing. In a Liberty Workforce business, both the workers and the owners bear risk, and therefore both share in the workerly profits. The workerly profits are distributed as a percentage of the owner's after-tax earnings and as a percentage of the worker's standard salary. Their percentage is the same in both cases. The profit-sharing percentage is the value calculated such that there is no remaining revenue after profit-sharing. So, if the profit-sharing percentage were 20%, then the owner Lee would receive profit sharing in the amount equal to 20% of its after-tax earnings, and each worker would receive profit sharing in the amount equal to 20% of his or her standard salary. Now let us look at a compensation scenario where the revenue remainder after costs and lease is less than standard payroll, resulting in a payroll shortfall. In this case, there are no profits to share we just need to calculate each worker's basic compensation. The first step is to calculate the pay ratio. This is the remainder of the revenue divided by the standard payroll. This pay ratio is multiplied by each worker's standard salary to arrive at the compensation that worker will receive. This is how compensation is calculated when there is insufficient revenue remaining after costs and the lease. The third element of Liberty Workforce to explain is governance in the workerly. Governance of the ownerly remains unchanged from present business form, so it will not be discussed. Governance is deciding what is going to be done and who is going to do it, and then seeing that the decisions are carried out. The governance of the workerly is another place where the principles underpinning American political government are put to work in business. In a large workerly, there are three principal governance structures. They are nested, one within the other. The work group is the fundamental organization of the business. Units are comprised of many work groups. The federal is the organization above all the units in the workerly. This is analogous to our political governments. Cities and counties are the basic units of government. The state governs over particular cities and counties grouped together. All the states are joined together in the United States. The design objective of Liberty Workforce is that every worker has maximum freedom, adequate resources, complete responsibility and accountability for his or her work. 
This provides the optimum environment for the dignity and development of each worker. These are the purposes behind the U.S. Constitution. Liberty Workforce strives to fulfill these purposes at every level of governance. Why should a business care about the development of its workers? To a very large degree, the workers are the business. Businesses who value industry standard, interchangeable, and replaceable workers will get what they value. A standard business, which is indistinguishable from any other such business, and whose customers have no reason other than price to choose their products over the competitions. Developing workers increases the value and competitiveness of the business. Each worker is a member of at least one work group. All work done in the workerly is done by work groups. A work group is a self-directed team. The members of the group select their group leader, determine group work methods, divide group work, and manage group membership. Workers volunteer for work or accept assignments in the work group of their own free will and choice. Allowing the worker to exercise their agency to choose is not only respectful of the individual, it increases the worker's ownership of the work done. Where this individual pride is engaged, the quality rises and the worker's commitment to the success of the business is increased. Worker governance of the group puts the people who are most aware of opportunities to improve in charge of realizing them. Putting the workers in charge of their immediate work world increases morale, reduces turnover, and increases productivity. Work groups are organized together in units. A unit is like a small business. It has all the necessary business functions to operate independently. A unit size is limited to about 250 workers so that every worker can personally know every other worker. When this limit is exceeded, the unit is divided. The unit is presided over by a unit leader. The president of the workerly appoints the unit leader with the approval of the board of directors and the workers of the unit. The unit leader may have assistant leaders if needed, but there are no supervisors or middle management. The principal organ of coordination in the unit is the leadership council. It is composed of the unit leader and each of the work group leaders. Other ad hoc committees to coordinate the work are formed by the workers where needed. In addition, workers must develop the skills, habits, and tools to coordinate and to collaborate directly with other workers. The separation of powers principle of the U.S. Constitution is implemented in both the unit and federal government structures. The unit leader only has executive powers. The judicial powers reside in the unit court, and the legislative powers reside in the unit legislature. Rules and decisions affecting the unit are made by the unit legislature. The workers in each individual unit are allowed to determine the structure and operation of their legislature, so long as it is democratic. It could be a direct democracy of all the workers like a New England town meeting, or it could be a representative democracy similar to a town council, or a combination of both. The court handles worker discipline, including separation from the workerly. Any trial that could result in less money to a worker or in separation uses a jury of peers. The judge also administers the voting in the unit and calls grand juries to investigate potential wrongdoing. The judge is a worker in the unit who accepts these judicial responsibilities in addition to regular duties. The federal is the governance structure around all the units. It governs in matters between, but not within, the units. It deals with issues common to all workers. It also represents the workerly in affairs outside the business. The federal concept may be better understood by comparing it to other governing concepts. The most common business government system is what I call unitary. In this system, the highest officer, such as the president or the CEO, can govern in every affair of the business, down to and including those of the lowest worker. The business operates as one unit. The bureaucracy is a large unitary government. One example will suffice to illustrate the challenges of the unitary concept in governing large businesses. When a low worker desires to do something extraordinary, he must request permission from his superior. The superior can deny the request, but probably does not feel he has authority to approve it. So he asks his manager. This process repeats itself until either a manager says no 
or until the request gets to a manager who has the guts to put his career on the line to approve it, or until it reaches the president. Every boss can say no, but few can or will say yes. This not only stifles innovation, but increases the calendar time it takes to make a decision. Furthermore, at every step up the ladder, the reviewing manager knows less and less about the context of the requested deviation. This decreases the likelihood of obtaining a good decision. Unitary governance of large organizations stifles change, adaptation, and innovation. A government which is part of a federal structure only concerns itself with affairs assigned to it. It does not govern in affairs at levels beneath it or above it. For example, a state governor does not report to the President of the United States, nor does a state governor have authority to direct a city mayor. The governor only has authority over state affairs. The President commands the armed forces of the United States, but has no authority over city police. To make changes in the police force, one need not convince anyone higher than the mayor and the city council. Such a change does not have to be approved by the state governor or the U.S. president. In federal governance systems, each level of governance is assigned certain powers. When governing in those assigned arenas, each level of governance is the ultimate authority, subject only to the sovereign will of the people. This reduction in layers of management in federal systems reduces impediments to change and innovation. The governing powers of the federal are distributed into separate executive, a legislative, and judicial branches, as in the unit. The chief executive is the president. The board of directors appoint the president with the approval of the worker senate. He or she may be assisted by vice presidents in a very large worker league. These presidents, together with the directors of each business function, form the cabinet. The workers of the federal are organized into work groups like in the units. The Congress of the Liberty Workforce Business is bicameral. The owner at least board of directors, or other governing body if not a corporation, form one chamber. The workers' senate forms the other chamber. The workers elect the senators. The Supreme Court determines the constitutionality of workerly laws and adjudicates in disputes between the units and between the federal and the units. It is anticipated that senators and justices will be part-time efforts that willing workers take on in addition to their regular duties. Positions of power attract people who wish to exercise power. Some of these people inadvertently or purposefully abuse that power. In the workgroup peer pressure backed up with the workgroup's power to remove any leader is sufficient to manage any workgroup leader on a power trip. At the unit level, workers generally know each other and can more easily combine to limit the powers of a unit despot. The separation of powers and recall elections are all the help they need to handle things at the unit level. But at the federal level, it is extremely difficult to curb or eliminate a despot without strong helping mechanisms. Thus, it is very important to create mechanisms that check the powers of federal workers and that increase the unit's power to balance that of the Federals. One of these checks is called interposition. When a unit feels that the Federal is meddling in its internal affairs contrary to the Constitution, the unit may tell the Federal that it will not comply with whatever law, request, or regulation it feels is unconstitutional. The Federal must then sue the unit in the Workerly Supreme Court to force compliance. Another check on the Federal power is that the President and other Federal officers can be impeached. James Madison, the father of the U.S. Constitution, wrote, It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is, no doubt, the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. The appropriate governance form changes as a business grows in size. 
a small business would only use the work group. As the number of workers increases beyond what is appropriate for one work group, the work group would be divided into two or more work groups, and at the same time, a unit structure would be created to govern over these multiple work groups. When the business grows further to near 300 workers, its single unit is divided into multiple units and a federal level is created. This federal approach of nested governance structures, work groups within units and units within federal, provides key benefits. It allows a business to grow while maintaining the agility, creativity, and collegiality of small business, but still obtaining the great enterprise capacities of large business. It does this without the stifling bureaucracy present in many large businesses built with unitary governance structures. The transition to Liberty Workforce will require more change from leaders than from any other worker. The judicial and legislative duties of conventional business leaders have been assigned to other workers. The leader cannot fire, promote, or discipline a worker. In a business comprised of self-directed work groups, the skills and behaviors implied in words like boss, manager, and supervisor are no longer relevant. Leaders who cannot stop themselves from making all decisions and ordering people around will find themselves quickly fired by the workers. A theory why a leader and a transformational leader would be better descriptions for the successful Liberty Workforce leader. The successful leader will be one who inspires and assists workers to grow. The leader will bring his or her ideas to the unit and help the workers to create a common vision from all their ideas. As the Liberty Workforce leader has almost no positional authority, she or he must influence fellow workers through personal means. The leader is like a building operating engineer. The engineer does not tell the heating furnace when to fire and when to turn off. The furnace has its own control system to do that. The engineer's job is to monitor the building systems and have them repaired if they malfunction. Like the engineer, the leader monitors the functioning of the organization to see that all the systems are working properly. When something is broken, the leader intervenes to restore the organization to proper working order. When a worker has a problem, the leader offers to help. This last section is not all that remains to be explained about Liberty Workforce. There's much more, but that's left to the website wiki. This section serves two purposes. First, it shows how Liberty Workforce improves on the process of involuntary worker separation. And second, it illustrates how the governance mechanisms we have just discussed perform this process. We will look at two kinds of involuntary worker separation, the layoff of workers and the separation of an individual worker by a work group. The work group initiated involuntary worker separation procedure protects the business from two kinds of deviancies, the tragedy of the commons and the dysfunctional worker. The tragedy of the commons is a situation where individuals can use a common resource to benefit themselves at the expense of the other owners of the resource. For example, a worker may just goof off but still collect a paycheck. Fellow workers are often the most knowledgeable about who is working hard and effectively and who is not. To maintain the business and preserve justice, the workers must be given a process to eliminate the tragedy of the commons. The workers in Liberty Workforce are bearing much of the risk of the business. It would be a serious morale and performance problem to saddle the work group with a dysfunctional worker without recourse. The work group initiated involuntary worker separation process was created to address these two deviancies. Before using this process, the leader and the workers of the work group should do all they can to resolve the issue. The process is a last resort. It works as follows. To begin, at least two workers in the work group must file complaints to the judge. The work group leader may be one of those two. The unit leader verifies to the judge that the workers did actually make the complaints. And when there are at least two verified complaints, the judge holds a secret ballot in the work group to remove the worker. A simple majority vote removes the worker from the work group. The unit leader helps the removed worker find a position in another work group. If needed, the unit leader will help the removed worker change his behaviors and skills. Now, if no position can be found within 30 days, the removed worker's case is taken up by the court. If all the procedures have been followed correctly, the court separates the worker from the worker lead. Until the separation is finalized by the court, the removed worker receives his normal compensation. But if the vote fails, or the removed worker finds another position, 
or the court finds improper procedures were followed, the worker remains in the workerly. The very existence of this process will provide benefits, even if it's not used. When workers know that fellow workers can cause them to be separated, they'll be more motivated to cooperate and be diligent in their work. And when workers know they can get someone separated if the need arises, they'll be less frustrated with their fellow workers and more willing to try to work things out. These two will act together to smooth out work life and reduce the need to ever use this work group initiated separation procedure. The other involuntary worker separation I will explain here is the layoff. Every business needs the capability to lay off workers. A healthy economy depends on workers moving from falling businesses to rising businesses. Nonetheless, the potential of a layoff can wear on the workers. Improperly handled, it drains strength from them that could be better employed in creating success for the business. The threat is discussed amongst the workers, resulting in lost productivity. In the current forms of business, the owners make the decision to lay off alone, and the workers suffer the consequences. This is closer to a master-slave paradigm. Workers feel impotent in the face of it. This attitude seeps into other places. Rather than believe they can solve business challenges, they feel hopeless about them, too. As a result, these challenges may not be met like they would in better times. Liberty Workforce greatly improves the situation. The workers and the owners decide about the layoff together. The layoff procedure is a two-step process. In the first step, the workers decide if there will be a layoff, and if so, what the reduction will be in standard payroll dollars. The second step determines which workers will be laid off, or the procedure for determining who will be laid off. Breaking the process into these two steps is necessary. A one-step process would unfairly burden those workers not being laid off with the knowledge of who was at risk when they went to vote. It could be very emotionally conflicting to force them to choose between laying off a friend and getting less money in their paycheck. Furthermore, if this knowledge was determined in advance, the worker vote could almost be moot. Those workers being laid off would likely vote against the layoff, but they would be easily outvoted by those workers who were not being laid off but whose compensation would be increased by the layoff. The first step in the layoff process begins when a significant portion of the production capacity is or will be idle, despite efforts to sell its output. A bill to determine the percent reduction in standard payroll dollars is written, debated, and voted on by the owner's board of directors and the worker senate, who together make up Congress. If a simple majority in both these houses are in favor of the bill, then it is forwarded to the federal president for review. If the president signs the bill, the workers themselves then vote on the bill. If 75% of the workers vote in favor of the bill, then it becomes law, and Congress proceeds to step two in the process. If either the president or the workers do not approve the bill, Congress can override them if at least 75% of the directors and senators vote in favor of the bill. But if they do not override them, then there is no layoff. In the second step, a bill specifying who will be laid off or the procedure to determine the same is written, debated, and voted on by the Congress. If a simple majority in each House of Congress is in favor of the bill, then it is forwarded to the federal president for review. If the president signs the bill, then the indicated workers are laid off. Again, Congress can override a presidential veto. But if they do not override the veto, there is no layoff until they arrive at an acceptable procedure. The goal of Liberty Workforce is to remove most of the layoff burden for the good of the worker, the owners, and the business. This is accomplished in four ways. First, the urgency for a layoff comes from falling compensation, not from falling profits. Falling compensation is an early warning sign of a potential layoff. It will cause workers to redouble their efforts to increase revenue. Other workers will self-select to leave. These combine to lower the probability of a layoff. Second, the workers and the owners decide together whether they would prefer a layoff or to have less compensation. This increase in power over their fate reduces their hopelessness, giving them more energy to succeed. Third, during the preliminary hearings about a layoff and later during the debates in Congress, there will be much research and discussion of alternatives, impacts, and so forth. Workers will be expressing their views to their senators. 
This transparency gives workers information which will help them effectively deal with the economic realities. And last, by sharing in the decision to lay off, workers help shoulder the load considerate owners have traditionally borne alone. In summary, Liberty Workforce is a form of business where the owners and the workers share together the governance, the work, the risks, and the rewards of their business. A Liberty Workforce business is comprised of two legal entities, the ownerly and the workerly. The ownerly owns the assets of the business. All the workers are members of the workerly. The business relationship between these two entities is set forth in the lease. The workerly leases the assets from the ownerly. This lease requires that both entities abide by the business constitution. Through this lease and the constitution, worker rights are established. This bifurcated business structure allows worker-managed businesses access to the same sources of capital as conventional businesses. The workerly distributes the revenues of its business operations according to priority. First, the costs are paid. Then the workerly makes its lease payment to the ownerly. This payment is sufficient to assure the owners an average profit each year. Paying the lease before compensating the workers is one of the two primary inducements for owners to share governance with the workers. With the remainder of the revenue after paying costs and the lease, the workerly addresses payroll. If there is not enough left, each worker only receives a portion of their standard salary. If there is more than enough to make standard payroll, then the remaining profit is shared between the owners and the workers. The amount of worker compensation is directly proportional to business success. This aligns the worker's interests with those of the owner. Creating this common cause is the second primary inducement for the owner to accept Liberty Workforce. The governance structure of the Liberty Workforce business is based on the principles used to create the U.S. Constitution. The work group is the fundamental governance structure of Liberty Workforce. All workers are organized into self-directed work groups. Units are formed of multiple work groups. There is separation of powers in the unit. The executive is the unit leader. The unit court wields the judicial power. The unit legislature creates the laws and makes the major decisions for the unit. Liberty Workforce uses a federal approach. The stewardship of the unit is issues between and outside of the work groups. The unit government has limited authorities over affairs internal to the work group. Likewise, the federal is the governance structure dealing with issues between and outside of the units. It has only limited authority over affairs internal to the units. This is in contrast to unitary governance structures like bureaucracies where the president has complete authority over every employee in the business. This federal approach allows large businesses to have the advantages of small businesses, such as rapid adaptation and innovation, while maintaining the large resource advantages of a large business. Another benefit of Liberty Workforce to the owners is that they are almost guaranteed a profit every year. Referring back to the owner's problems fixed by Liberty Workforce, I have shown how workers share the financial burdens of the business with the owners. The workers are self-directed, so they need little policing. Workers think and act more like owners. As firings and layoffs are mostly handled by workers, owners are substantially relieved of this unpleasant responsibility, and workers are more likely to be fully engaged in their jobs because they are empowered and their compensation is at risk. Referring back to the workers' problems fixed by Liberty Workforce, the benefits to workers are, as compensation is now variable, Efforts and results of labor are more closely linked to monetary rewards. Liberties enjoyed by citizens are extended to the workplace. The prison doors are torn down. Improving processes and products will have an impact on worker compensation. It is worth the effort. Workers now have control over layoffs and plant closings. Workers voting together have the power to remove any leader from office. The day of abusive bosses is over. Moving to new features, the predictability resulting from rule of law, plus the greater freedoms, plus the responsibility for results, will yield greater professional and personal growth at work. Life will be more abundant. 
workers will develop greater competency in efficiently accomplishing tasks in a democracy. When these skills are transferred to the civic arena, better group decisions will be reached more efficiently and with less frustration in HOAs, PTAs, city councils, town meetings, and the like. Workers will be able to improve their quality of life through benefits they desire, such as telework, on-site daycare, and so forth. Social advocates should see a wider spread of worker self-management because it is no longer restricted by workers' lack of capital. An increase in civic participation as workers bring their new democratic skills to politics. Business will inherently be responsive to the needs of local society because the workers who are in charge are local citizens. This will occur naturally without coercion, without new laws, or other interventions. Liberty Workforce is a new form of business government that brings compelling benefits such as these. It is not the form every worker and owner will prefer, but for those who do, I invite you to take action. I invite owners and workers to install Liberty Workforce in your business. I'm just one person. The best products are the result of collaborative efforts. I invite you to contribute your expertise to enhance and to improve Liberty Workforce. I've set up a website to facilitate this sharing. The address will be on the final slide. I invite you to spread the word of Liberty Workforce to those you think might be interested. I hope the blessings of freedom someday will be enjoyed in all our institutions, private as well as public. Thank you.